Good afternoon and welcome to the English Language Proficiency Screener Test Administrator Overview and Training. My name is Alice Garcia and I am your Special Population Assessment Coordinator. Many of you have met me at Summit or at various other trainings. And with me is I'm Rachel McCluskey and I'm going to be overseeing the test administration side of ELPS and ELPT for you guys. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, today's goals. By the end of this presentation, you should know how to identify a student who needs to be screened, what the ELPS is and the components of the ELPS, how to administer the screener, what to do when you receive the results of the screener, and then at the very end, how to classify and support your EL student. So why do we screen? Basically, <clears throat> first of all, it is a federal requirement. We have to have some sort of system to go to an assessment that we give to incoming potential ELs to determine whether or not they are proficient in English and whether they need English support services in their classroom. So Louisiana decided to find a good system to use a good screener, and this is what we came upon. This is what we, we de decided to use, is our ELPS. And the screener provides us with a measure of a student's ability in listening, speaking, reading, writing, so just like the summative, but this, of course, is a much shorter, a more condensed version of that assessment. Um, and then, of course, this is our first statewide standardized screener. So ELPS is a tool for determining EL program placement. If a student is not score proficient on ELPS, that student is now an EL and will be given a parental notification letter and an EL accommodation form should be filled out. Since ELPS is new, we're treating 2018-19 school year as a transition year and we'll encourage all districts to use this free screener as soon as they can. But we do acknowledge that some of you will need to continue to use your legacy screeners. But by next year, we're hoping that everybody's using it across the state. And this is a list of key ELPS administration dates. Um, most importantly, that Air Secure browser needs to be installed on all of your computers. It is available now um, for download. So any device that's gonna be used for ELPS testing needs to have that Air Secure browser installed. In addition, TIDE is going to open on July 23rd for both user and student management. And then also that ELPS administration window for the 2018-2019 school year is going to open on August 1st. Then we're going to talk about who needs to be screened. Before we screen, though, <clears throat> there are two things you should consider. First of all, all students who screen will, will need a listed in order to take ELPS. So they may not be at the test on the first day that they register. But this time can be used to make the student more comfortable in the hopes that when we screen, the student will be able to give an accurate demonstration of his or her language ability. So whenever possible, give students a few days to acclimate to the school, computer, and even you, the test administrator, like maybe come talk to them, sit down with them. And if you want, if you feel that they may not have had a lot of exposure to technology, you can let them use the ELPS OTT, the same little online tool training that we use for our summative, they can use this to kind of prepare for ELPS because it's the exact same testing platform. <clears throat> so how do we identify an English learner? This should be a review of the same criteria that you've used in the past to identify which students to screen, but just in case, remember that an EL is typically a student that when provided a home language survey, the parents have indicated in one of the blanks that a language other than English has spoken. Usually within 30 days of registering, it used to be 30 days at the beginning of the school and then two weeks during the remainder of the school year, but federal guidelines have changed to make it 30 days no matter when they enroll. So within 30 days of registering, being identified as a potential EL, they should be screened and then the parents should be notified. This is a flow chart that was available on the English Learner website uh, in actually the English Learner Library, and it kind of takes you through each of the steps that you can follow to determine whether or not a student is an English learner. Um, one of the big questions we received when starting you know, this process with ELPS is what do we do if we receive transfer students? So for districts that may receive transfer students who have already come with documentation of being identified as English learners, if that student is transferring from another state, that student still is going to need to be screened with ELPS to ensure that the student qualifies for entry into Louisiana's EL program. If that student is transferring within Louisiana just from another district, once you've added that student to TIDE with that listed, 
that ELPS or ELPT score can be accessed in the ORS under current student scores. And that screenshot right there shows you in ORS how you can search for those students. So as soon as they're added into TIDE you can, with their listed, you'll be able to pull those scores if they already have them. All right, let's talk a little bit about pre-K students and kindergartners. As you know, pre-K students are not eligible for EL services until they enter kindergarten. Pre-K screening usually takes place the spring and summer before an eligible student begins kindergarten. So what we're also gonna do though is since a lot of kindergarten students, once they've enrolled, depending on where they are in the year, depends on how much actual kindergarten skills that they've been able to be exposed to. So we're actually gonna screen them using the pre-K test during these times. So take a look at these months. So during August and December, it's called future kindergarten, but it's basically pre-K. So incoming kindergarten students will take the pre-K test in January through March because we feel like they've been exposed to at least a good amount of kindergarten skills. They will use the kindergarten test. And then March to July, that's when you're going to screen your rising kindergartners with um, your rising, yeah, your rising kindergartners with the pre-K test. All right, and for students that may enroll in your district that have special needs, if the student enrolls and has a documented accommodations plan, applicable accommodations for statewide assessments can be provided for ELPS. This would include things like braille testing or scribing or assistive technology that would be documented on that accommodations plan. Most of these students, though, are going to enroll without an accommodations plan. If you have a student that has evidence of a significant hearing or vision impairment that might impact certain domains on ELPS, domain exemptions can be requested for those students. Um, and all of those accommodations questions, a domain exemption questions, and even your Braille test orders are, need to get, are going to be need to be sent to assessment at la.gov. Okay, grade level screening. So just like with the summative, when a student comes in, they should be screened using the grade level that they will pretend potentially enter. So if they're coming in as a first grader, they'll take the grade one test. If they come in as a fifth grader, they'll take the test in the grade four or five um, band. The exception, it's not really an exception, is our T9 students. Your T9 students should take the grade nine through 12 screener. And just an overview of some of our ELPS key features. ELPS is gonna have multiple stopping points throughout the screener. Students only take the entire screener if they're on track to being proficient. So a student whose screener stops after step two and doesn't make it to step three are gonna be eligible for EL services. After the first few weeks of screening, a majority of school reports should be available the same day as testing is completed. School reports for students who are able to complete all three steps of the screener are gonna be available within three to seven days after submission. And then also, again, to repeat, any alternative forms of ELPS, for example, Braille, are gonna be available and may be requested by emailing assessment at la.gov. And we're gonna review now a few of the components of ELPS. So unlike ELP, the ELP is not broken down by language domains, but instead by steps where each language domain is assessed. So you have our step one, which is almost like a little practice test. It familiarizes the student, gives the student an opportunity to navigate through the system. It's very short, very quick. So we get to step two, which is the first part of our operational test. This is truly like the heart, like the meat of the test. It opens the speaking items, it contains 2832. We'll get into more detail about step two and step three as we move along. The other thing to remember is that step three, the majority of students will actually finish testing at the end of step two and won't move on to step three, and that's fine. Okay, step one is short and more of an introduction, like I said before. Step one um, has four to six items designed to familiarize students with testing platform. The four to six items varies, varies on grade level. So a kindergarten student will only have, say, four items, or a nine through 12 student will have the six items. Then we have three to four items to determine students' comfort with technology. So they'll have some of those drag and drop, those technology enhanced items that they can practice with, because those are what they're gonna see when they get to step two and potentially step three. And it does include two practice speaking items, because we want students to have the opportunity to practice speaking into a microphone and recording it in the actual testing platform. At the end of step one, the TA will make two decisions. Does the student have enough English skills to continue on to the operational test? And is the student comfortable enough with the technology to test without TA assistance? 
Right, and that first stopping point, if a student refuses to or is an unable to participate in the test, maybe they don't have enough English ability to actually go through the test, um, the TA must at least go through the end of step one for a student report to generate. So basically what that means is in the final screen of step one, the TA is going to need to select, and it's in that screenshot, student is a non-participant, the test will not continue to step two. Once that is selected, the gen it will generate a report of proficiency not demonstrated, and that student is now eligible for English Learner Services. So if they were unable to participate in that screener, they will be eligible for English Learner Services. If the TA feels that you need to maybe stop, so the student is uncomfortable in step one, and you feel like they would just benefit from some more practice, the student, you can pause the testing, and you can go into that ELTT OTT, and practice a little bit more so that student is comfortable with the system. If the student does opt to do that, to do some more practice with the OTT, they are going to be able to resume the screen or where they left off prior to exiting. All right, step two, this is the first part of the operational test. We have between 28 to 32 items across all four language domains. The first four items are speaking items that are scored on the fly. And we're gonna go into greater detail about that shortly. Step two, like I said, is the main operational test for the majority of students. So most students will do step two and they will actually be done with the test. You'll have some, a small percentage that will continue on at step three. If they continue on, it's because they have the potential to be proficient. And this step two is actually scored as the student test either by the TA with the on-the-fly speaking task or the computer with the remaining items. So that's one thing that I think is really, really cool about the way this test is set up is that it is actually scoring as the student is testing. The student's performance on step two, like I've said before, determines if they progress to step three. And so here is an example. <clears throat> step two begins with a few speaking items that are scored by the TA in one of two ways. The TA can either listen as the student speaks, and one way to do this is you would actually give the student the headphones, but have them place it around the student's neck, which is described in the center of the slide here. <clears throat> and the idea is to put it around the, the neck so that way the TA can actually hear the prompt before the student starts responding. The microphone should be positioned to the student's mouth for it, so that way it is recording. And the idea here is that you could actually grade it as you're hearing it or you could just have the student speak directly into the system, record it as normal, don't worry about listening, because you'll have an opportunity to listen to what the student said with the information that you need to score it um, later, okay? But if you wanna do it on the fly, which is probably how I would do it, especially after I've done these five or six times, I would go ahead and start scoring it as the student is speaking. So this is the screener rubric that you're gonna use for all grades, kindergarten through 12, for all four items. And this is available in the ELP portal at the moment. So here's a, a, the speaking sample. This is what it's basically going to look like. One significant difference is that the student won't see all four questions at once. They'll see one question with the image. They'll be able to record their answer and then go to the next um, screen, which will be the same image, but with another question and they'll record it and it'll progress on like that. And then at the end, but actually before this, <clears throat> at the end of the speaking task, you'll have the opportunity to score them. And so the, the TA will actually take the computer back away from the student, enter in the scores, turn it back over to the student, and the student will continue on with the rest of step two. So step two continues with tasks and questions from the remaining three domains. Once students reach the end of step two, they will see a review screen similar to this one. So this is what they're gonna see when they've actually finished all of step two. And you saw these kinds of screens on ELP. The little, if you see those little red triangles, it means the student has not answered that question. For students who will not score proficient, the test will end after step two. Students will review their answers and then be prompted to select the end test button. For students who have the potential to score proficient, the test will continue after the view screen. So basically, the student gets the end test button. They're done. If you don't see that and the test just continues, that means the student has the potential to be proficient and is gonna continue testing in step three. Step three, approximately 25 to 30% of students will progress to step three. 
It consists again of 18 to 28 items across all four language domains. And this one actually increases in difficulty. So you may have students who, and they'll, they'll notice it too, because it suddenly gets a lot harder as they're working through it. So you'll have some students who might just have to stop in the middle of three, and then you'll just um, basically hit, you know, next, 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 until you get to the end and go ahead and submit it. But if not, if you have a student who could potentially complete this whole section and score proficient, they should go through every question, even though it's going to get harder. Their speaking and writing items, these are sent to the vendor for scoring. So there's no TA scoring on the fly during step three. Kindergarten and grade one have two speaking items and no writing. A small percentage of students, like we said, with the potential to demonstrate proficiency will progress to step three. <clears throat> score reports for these students will be available three to seven days after the screener is submitted. And high school students are given priority scoring. So they, whenever their tests come into the vendor, the vendor jumps on those very quickly and tries to score them and get them back to our test site as quickly as possible. Here are the suggested times for testing. Uh, do expect some variations, especially in the first few weeks, as you adjust to administering the new test. So as you see, I've given a lot of different kinds of screeners. This one potentially has, could be a very quick screening process, depending on how much English your student has, or even if they are gonna score proficient. I was used to giving screeners that took two days. So I really like the fact that this one is gonna be, should be, doesn't have to be, but should be a one day process. All right, everybody's favorite part, the actual administration of the ELF. So I know we have a lot of different roles on here, so I'm just gonna do a quick overview of the ELF's administration systems. All of these systems and documents are going to be very similar to the ones you'll have for ELPT. Some of them will also be both for ELPT and ELF. So again, all the systems are exactly the same as ELPT. You have tied where students and users are managed, and then you can also manage assessment completion and your appeals through time. You have your TDS, which is used by TAs to administer ELF, and then also that Air Secure browser where students take ELF. You have the ORS, is where you can view and download student assessment reports. And then your DEI, which is going to be used when you're entering students' um, responses if they're using an accommodated form like Braille. And then the administrative documents, again, are the same um, as ELPT. There might be a few variations. And they're all posted in that ELPT portal under the ELF section. So first you have your TIDE user guide, um, which again, just reviews the user and student management, screener status management, and the appeals process. The TA user guide, which will give an overview of how the TA and student will access ELF. And then the ELF TAM will provide specific TA instructions for administering ELF, and that includes that script for the TA to read as the student is screening. And there are a few other ones um, that ELF Step two speaking scoring document Alice just reviewed that's posted in the portal. Um, every TA should have that printed out as they administer a screener to a student. And then just a few others, the ORS manual, the DEI manual, and then accessibility and accommodations manual are all available for you in that ELPT portal under the ELF section. And just a review, so you have some technology documents for downloading that um, secure browser and making sure all your system requirements are ready to go. These should be shared with your technology coordinators and all are posted under that ELPT portal under the technology coordinators manual. You just wanna make sure that everything with tech is ready to go come August 1 when that screener opens. All right actually setting up to administer the screener. As we know, ELPS is taken through AIR. It's the same portal, that same system that we used for ELPT. Um, and prior to testing, as I said before, that AIR secure browser must be installed on all of your devices. Um, the secure browser installation manual is what you should reference for, how to, for directions on downloading it. Um, and then TIDE you'll use to administer, to manage your test administrators, your students, and their accommodations. Both this year, district test coordinators and student test coordinators will have permission to add and upload students in time. So I know in previous, last year, we only had that as a permission for district test coordinators. This year, we will allow school test coordinators to add and upload students, which should take a little bit of a load off your district test coordinators. I mean, the biggest change here, students must have a listed in order to be entered into TIDE. This may require a change in how you register students um, who might qualify for EL services. 
because I know a lot of districts screen as soon as a student registers to actually take out, they're going to need a list aid to actually be entered into TIDE and take out. Um, students will also need headsets with those microphones, the same exact procedure as ELPT. And then at, before you screen, have your tech people make sure that pop-up windows and microphone settings are enabled on all devices. Um, so just make sure you're coordinating with your technology coordinators so that everything is set up and good to go. And because I know we have some district test coordinators and school test coordinators on this call, adding users to TIDE to manage testing. So this is anybody who needs access to reports and anybody who's going to administer the screener. Um, both beginning July 23rd, TIDE will open for test setup for the 2018-2019 school year for ELPS. DTC is you'll receive an email to set up your account. From there, you can go in and add your STCs and add your test administrators. And our available roles for ELPS are the same as ELPT. You have your district test coordinator, school test coordinator, and test administrator. So adding students, same exact procedure, except when you go through to do accommodations, it will be script split screen for ELPS and ELPT. Again, this year, district test coordinators and school test coordinators will be able to add and upload students. I know a lot of you are probably excited about that, but they have to have a listed before you enter them. Um, if they enroll with an accommodations plan, you'll be able to put it in as you upload the student into TIDE. And this one's important. I know a lot of people didn't utilize the ELPS testing tickets for ELPT because some students were familiar with their listed. But for ELF, since these students are new enrollees, they likely will not have their listed memorized. So testing tickets are probably something you'll want to take advantage of. The testing tickets will have their listed and have their name on it. Um, so basically, when they go to log in to test, they'll need their listed, their first name, and then the session ID created by the TA. If you'd like to utilize that test ticket feature, they can be printed in TIDE by a district school test coordinator and STC um, under that administering test portion of the TIDE site. Moving on. So for our actual test administrators, um, test sessions must be created less than 20 minutes prior to starting out to prevent the system from timing out. In order to create a test session, it happens in the moment. You'll log into that test about that testing site, which can be accessed in the Louisiana EL portal. And then when you log in using your TIDE username and password, you'll select the grade band that you're going to be using to administer the screener. From there, a session ID will automatically pop up on your screen, and that little screenshot with the red arrow is an example of what that session ID will look, at, look like, and you'll provide that session ID to the student screening. Um, so that session ID will be a portion of how they log into that AirSecure browser. And then just below, we have those grade bands listed for you for what they need to take. So once you select your grade band, you'll provide that student with that session ID, and that student can log into Insight using their first name, their student ID, which is their listed, and then that session ID that you create in the moment. Um, the TA, you'll then have to go back to that testing screen and approve the student to test in the TA interface. So you'll just get a little pop-up window saying somebody is requested to test, and you can click that you approve them to test. Um, the student will be required to do an audio and recording check prior to taking ELPS, so just make sure that the microphones are working and that the um, headset is working to the volume that they want. Um, and then the biggest thing for this is if you log into the screener after that student accesses ELPS, if four days have gone by and for some reason you've paused this test or not completed it, the test is going to auto-submit. So the student logs into the test after this and takes, you know, takes a few steps and maybe stops and pauses for some reason. It's just important to track to make sure that that student does complete the test after four days. And after that four-day window, the test will auto-submit and be scored. And then this chart just provides a little review of the steps that Alice already reviewed. So I'm not going to go over it too much. This is just an overview of the steps that we discussed in previous slides. All right, so once we've completed the screener, what do I do with the results? Well, first, this is what our results are going to look like. They're going to look a lot like the reports that we received from ELPS, and they're going to give us some of the same information. Remember that students have to attempt at least one question, okay? And remember that's for those students who are refusing or are unable because they have such limited English. You should still take them through step one, take them to the end, and submit it and then they will get a report, okay? 
So the re reports will show an overall proficiency status, and this will help us determine their EL eligibility, and then also give us their domain performance levels. And this we should use for instructional planning. We also want to make our parents aware of how their students did on this test. So continuing with the results, fundamentally, the results are used to determine placement into the EL program, but since we will have a more detailed report of the student's language abilities in our four domains, we can also make some decisions about what kinds of support the student will need, and that is what this slide describes. Be sure to refer to our Louisiana connectors for L because it does correspond with the results from this test. So if you have a student who has scored a level one in, say, speaking, look at the standards that coordinate correlate with that with the speaking portion of the test and that'll kind of give you a list of things that that student should be able to do and this is the kind of information you're going to want to provide to your content teachers so these are proficiency levels we technically have four we're really three we have our emerging progressing and proficient and then we have our proficiency not demonstrated and that's for those students who, who really have such limited English and you're going to get a, you're going to get a good amount of those students um, everybody but proficient is eligible for EL status, so they will be able to receive services as long as their parents um, give permission. And if they're proficient, we do not provide them uh, with EL services. Now, in the past, what I've done is when I had a student who came and was new to the country and they were able to score proficient, woohoo! A lot of times I would just sort of check in with them because even though they may have the English, they may not have the familiarity with the school system and how things work. So a lot of times I would just say, hey, you know, these are the people you want to talk to if you have questions about how school works. So just that as a courtesy, you might consider doing something like that. So how do I classify a student as EL? Well, once they've taken ELF and they've not scored proficient, they are classified as an English learner. You want to make sure that this is updated in your school information system. This is very, very important. Okay, within 30 days of that student registering and taking this test, this is part of that 30 days, you have to inform the student's parents. <clears throat> this right here is a screenshot of our newly updated EL parent notification letter. This is, of course, a recommendation, but not a requirement that you use this letter. Your district may already have one available, but this letter is in the English Learner, web, uh, English Learner Library, and it is in a Word document so that you may take it and edit it as needed. It is available in English, Spanish, Arabic, and Vietnamese, and it has both ELP and ELP information on it. So when we have our results, once the student has been identified and parents have been notified, the next step is to determine the types of support and accommodations the EL will need. These will be documented on the EL accommodations form, which will be updated soon. All students, and this is important, okay, all students, even those where the parents have not granted permission, are required to have an accommodation form filled out. However, if parents deny permission, the student should not be pulled or given additional intervention services related to the English learner program outside their content classroom. So again, even if a student has scored other than proficient in ELP, but the parents say no, they're actually entitled to receiving accommodations on their assessments and in their classrooms. But again, those students should not be pulled or be given um, additional intervention services. Okay, so this is important. That is a federal requirement. So once the student has been identified and classified as an EL, they are required to take ELP. Even if the parent says, no, I don't want them receiving any services, they still have to take ELP. And of course, it's given each year and it's administered the same platform as ELP. Uh, the testing window for this year is February 4th through March 15th. These are the assessment results that will be included in school accountability. And if you want more information about EL, you can reference our newly updated frequently asked questions. It's available in the English Learner Library and also the EL identification flowchart. And we have our ELP assessment guide. These are a list of resources that you can access if you need any information. Like I said, that EL accommodation form, we're changing it from EL accommodation plan to EL accommodation form, and it will be updated shortly, and it is available in four languages. All right, so next steps, which you should be doing now, is obviously we're reviewing all of those ELPS administration documents that can be found in the ELPT portal in the ELPS section. 
um, and key things that secure browser needs to be downloaded on any device being used for screening. And then again, for between now, well, beginning July 23rd, manage those users and students in Tide, and then starting August 1, administer ELF. Um, at this point, I think we have a few, a few questions available, and if you have any, you can feel free to type them in. If you have any questions after this is over, please just feel free to send them to assessment at la.gov, and we'll answer them as quickly as we can. So the first question is, if a student is on step one and they don't do anything, there's no verbal response, can they try again later? If they pause it, you can, but that's when you should probably pause it and let them practice with the OTTs and then come back to it. <clears throat> I wouldn't let much time pass though, because it does have the auto submit. But of course, do try to determine whether that student is literally unable, like they just don't know anything, they, they don't have enough English, or if they're just completely petrified and terrified of the situation. If it is more of a, I'm scared, I don't, I don't, I can't do anything right now, then yeah, practicing might help. If it is literally, I don't even understand, you say hi to me, that soon's gonna be an EL, I would just go ahead and go to the end of step one and submit it, <clears throat> and get that student report and get them going on getting those accommodations and support. The next question is, can I use the same devices I used for ELPT last year to administer the screener? Well, you sure can. I hope that makes you happy. So it's going to be the exact same portal, that Air Secure Browser, nothing new needs to be downloaded. And then as long as your TA has a separate device they can use to kind of launch that testing site and get that session ID, you'll be good to go. Um, we have another question asking about where to get this presentation. So it is currently posted in the English Learner Library and in the Assessment Library. It's also being recorded right now, so the recording will post in a few days, um, and that'll be in the YouTube account. The next question is, can reports for ELPT um, be pulled by school instead of each individual student? So. Actual individual student reports can be pulled by school if you go in under the school reports section of the ORS. However, prior to the next administration of ELPT, they will hopefully be making some ORS changes that will make this a little bit more user friendly for you. But for, yeah, for ELPS, because it's going to be more of an individualized test, um, it's probably best to pull those reports by just using that search for listed function in ORS. And all of that's outlined in that ORS user guide. All right, I don't see any other questions. Thank y'all so much for joining. Again, this presentation is in the assessment library and in the English learner library, and it's also being recorded. We'll send out the link in the weekly newsletters, and um, you can also access it just by going to the LDOE YouTube account. So that should be up in about five days. If you have any questions, please email them to assessment at la.gov. Thank you.